thanks for staying long and for having me here. It's a complete privilege to return. I had the honor of being here last year as well. And, um, you know, I feel like the entire time I've been here, since Thursday evening, I've been thinking about rewriting my talk. And every time I hear someone say something, I think about something else I'm feeling, just like all of us, and what I can share. But really, I'm here to just tell you about what it's felt like. I'm coming on my third anniversary of blogging as a mom and a doctor. And I really just want to say, like, what does it feel like for us uh, as doctors and patients in the blogosphere? Um, as many people have pointed out, you know, we physicians and care providers are patients too. And I play the role of a patient and a patient advocate. I play the role as a mom and I play the role of a clinician. And I just want to tell you how it feels and some of the wisdom I've learned from all of you <laughs> along the way. So, um, you know, these are my titles. I would love to keep in touch with you. The easiest way to find me is Twitter, and that's not a joke. Um, but my website is around, um, and I work in these different places, which I'll discuss. And I think, one, you know, one of the wonderful things about this week has been listening to people's biographies on stage and learning about why it is that they ended up here. And um, I was chatting this morning about um, what it is that we're, why am I here? And I think the self-tracking day was a real delight for me and um, I was unaware with how much we're all self-tracking, and I was listening to um, some of the commentary, and there was a lot of like, so are you kind of treated like a freak, like when you do these things? Um, and then I heard people say, you know, so many of us um, don't really fit in, and you know what, I, I feel like I've really fit in in medicine. Um, I just have never had enough, and so it just the systems haven't really fed me in the way that I wanted them to. And so I do all these different things now that aren't actually that innovative. They really are the tools that are at all of our hands. It's just how we use them to build partnerships. And there are so many clinicians um, that I learn from every day here in the audience as pediatrician bloggers as well. Um, so, but I want to talk about, you know, I'm not really all that rogue. I don't do things um, outside so much. I'm a community pediatrician. I work two days a week in practice for the Everett clinic, and I partner with the Academy of Pediatrics, which is a group that represents 60,000 pediatricians, and I do that very intentionally. Um, I really want to be at the table with people who are making policies and decisions. I want to help understand and learn how to amplify. You know, when policy statements are made, the time that it takes from a policy to disseminate out to community providers can be years. It shouldn't be that way, but it really can be years, and we can do a much better job. Of course, I use social tools. Um, I'm on Twitter every day. I use Facebook. I don't friend my patients, but I follow along and listen from them, and they can put comments and reach me there. I'm on Google+, and um, I'm certainly on LinkedIn. But my real love, and I think the place where I'm doing what I feel is most natural and comes easiest for me, is on the blog. And that's a blog that I started three years ago, almost, with Seattle Children's. And I was hired, and I took a lot of time to figure out what it is I wanted to do. You know, I kind of approached them after Jenny McCarthy went on Oprah, and the next day, my patients were different. And I said, you know, I think you kind of need a blog. And they said, you know, I think we do too. And then we talked about it, and I, I didn't really read a lot of blogs, but I went and I watched and listened and learned and realized what I wanted it to be was a mommy blog. And really, so much of what I do on the blog is just share my journey of motherhood, and pediatrics, when something comes out, I don't actually blog about it the day that the embargo lifts, even though I get the embargo, I usually wait. And I use social tools to kind of figure out what's going on and see where myth is being created and seeing what people think, and then I kind of come back and tell people how it feels. But the new lesson for me is that social media really is changing the big amplifiers and the big megaphones that are out there. What I now do, too, is I use traditional media. And although I've been doing traditional media interviews for two or three years because I feel obligated to do so, what I now do is I work for NBC affiliate in Seattle. And although I do kind of what looks like everyone is a TV doctor, what I'm really doing is working with a producer. I choose the content. I choose the studies that I read. I choose the links that we review. I'm able to approve and edit all the B-roll and images that are there. I approve and edit the script that the reporter gives to me, and I approve the final content. So together, this team of health reporters, we can have a clinician and hopefully an expert who can look at research in a different way and work together with someone who understands messaging to really get the word out. I mean, it's a really different time that a social media job turned into a traditional media job. And it's a really big lesson for everyone that if you start 
to categorize what you know and what you learn. And if you start to read research and translate it in two or 300 words, and if you start to share between visits with your patients online, public education, not just personal or private health information, but lessons that you learn in clinic, and you put it out there, you might be handed bigger and bigger megaphones. And the incredible thing is, is that my relationship with patients are very different when they watch those things on TV and watch the blog and read these different lessons, what they're learning and how they're getting it, and the expertise that we can share back and forth can be really different. But one thing about the blog, and you, I would love for you to look at it, I approve all the comments, I write it all, it's not controlled in any way by the hospital with which I work, um, and, I, and I'm kind of constantly monitoring it. But really, I'm using this technology not to make things more uncomfortable in healthcare, but to make them more genuine, <laughs> to be real. And one of the, my favorite posts that actually hasn't been read very much by people is a post I wrote spontaneously the night before my mom started chemotherapy. And it was the moment of, utter overwhelm, I know exactly where I was sitting, and how I felt as her, you know, my mom lives alone, I'm her care advocate and, and help her and sit with her in her health care, but I'm also a mom to two young children, my son was, an, my youngest was an infant at the time, and I take care of my patients and I try to take care of myself and nurture my marriage and partnerships, but it's these kind of ideas, I think, that really make these social tools so novel and so exquisitely effective, that is the mortar of my blog. It's when I act like a person and talk like a patient or maybe like a doctor all together, talking about what I don't know so much more often than what I do know that I think makes change. And I do really talk about new research, um, but I really think um, it's when I talk about my life and my responses to how something goes poorly or well or how something feels about a new study. I love um, Pew Internet data because it kind of backs up and makes and reminds me that I am doing the right thing. I've contended for a long time that I believe we are ethically obligated to be online. I believe firmly that if four out of five or 80% of those are looking up health information online, I have to be there too. I mean, I just can't go back. Like, however tired I get, I'm not going to go back and be a doctor in the office only. I can't do that. It doesn't make any sense to me because I can explain so much more given a video camera or giving a Twitter handle or having a Facebook page. I'll never go back to just seeing patients in the office. Impact is really important to all of us. And although more than anything, my patients and the experiences in the exam room feed me and nurture me and drive me to learn and perfect and listen more than anything else, I can't go back. I have to be online. I mean, there really is no choice. And you're already converted. You're all here. I don't have to prove that to you. But medicine will look very different 10 years from now. And my job as a community pediatrician, I know will be very, very different as time goes forward. And data is, you know, hard to use. You know, 90% online sites have said that physicians use social media. The reality is maybe not so. When we surveyed our clinic, which is almost 300, 300 multi-specialty docs, we said, how many of you are using social tools? Six out of ten. And they're not using it for health. They're not using it for education. They're using it at home. But they're really tired. This is not about asking doctors to do more. This is about replacing, getting rid of redundancies instead of talking about things over and over and over again. What if I created an online curriculum? What if when you came to see me with your 15-month-old, when they're bouncing around the room and screaming and terrified of that exam, if at the end I gave you a pad of paper or a tablet and you could click, what blog posts you wanted, what information you wanted, and which reminders you wanted before the 18-month visit. So that instead of talking about rear fishing car seats in the exam room, instead of talking about developmental milestones that I expect for your 18-month-old in the exam room, what if you learned about it two or three days before you came? So when you got to the exam room, you were in a different place. You were directed and more informed about what was expected. And we started in a really new place. I'm not asking doctors to go home and write more and spend more hours on the computer. You know, I love the 20%, 25% number, which is a Pew number, that says, you know, 25% of people are accessing internet from a mobile device, a laptop or a screen. And I think it, what it serves to me is not just, oh, when you build these wonderful things, hopefully, that you make them for small screens. What it really shows me is that all of our expectations are entirely different of the health space and of the health experience. And it doesn't matter if you're an empowered patient or a clinician, but the way that you can get an answer on Google in 35 seconds 
different than it used to be going to the water cooler and asking your friends. And the way that you can curate information and the way that you go on Facebook and are concerned about a symptom or a situation and the way that we all kind of pine in. It's really changing what we do. And I'm so lucky to be a pediatrician because moms are uniquely inventive and excited about learning about health and uniquely adaptive to these products. So this is Nielsen data that says three out of four American moms were on Facebook in March. 50% of all moms are participating in social media access via a mobile device, compared with 37%. One in three bloggers is a mom defined by having a child under the age of 18. And 52% of parents with kids under 18 are blogging. Or 50, sorry, 52% of, of bloggers are parents. So, you know, all these numbers, and I don't have to convince you, but I think the big thing that's really happening is that we are confusing experience for expertise, and our N of ones are really important, and the self-tracking day was incredible to learn about that. Our personal data, our genetic makeup, our predisposition, our family history, our N of one is extremely important. But how we make decisions from allocation to disease to planning is really different for each of us. But we might be confusing someone that we know's experience for what expertise is out there. This is why we still love subspecialists and generalists in health. They've been trained for years to understand how to read studies, interpret them, and they have the experience and rich knowledge of learning amidst peers and mentors of how to care for people and make decisions. And when we only use stories, and when we have people, anyone and everyone with a megaphone, telling a story about their end of one, as someone defined earlier, you're not zero or 80, you're really just your data point. But we really need to let science come up and bubble up. We need more clinicians con continuing between visits to really express what they know so that those loud voices, those loud no voices of avoiding things that may be very beneficial, that change our environment like vaccines, so that we can contend by telling our own stories and getting that expertise out. And that's really what I'm doing in the blogosphere. The great thing is... <laughs> We really do trust doctors. You know, in the last couple of months, I've had some scary health experiences myself. And although I read a study three or four times and went to a physician, an expert, apparently a national expert, to talk about it, I knew I knew more about the study than he did. But I still really trusted how he understood the players, how he understood the controversy, and how we came together to make a decision. And a pediatric study from last year out of Gary Freed in the University of Michigan looked at really, you know, how do people trust celebrities versus doctors? Who do they trust the most to talk to us about our vaccine safety? Is it a celebrity? Is it a doctor? Is it your own pediatrician? And although the headlines were that 24% of people trusted a celebrity, that's what Time Magazine wrote about. 76% of parents said that they trusted their child's pediatrician the most. So if I don't take the time to talk about risk, and if I don't take the time to explain in blogs between visits when new studies come out, when new controversial parenting topics happen, if the only voice they hear is the celebrity voice, and the only time we get to talk in the exam room about vaccines, it's not going to work we're still trusted, as well we should be. I really believe that I have great limitations. I don't know everything. And I ultimately believe that my job as a doctor, online, on television, in the exam room, is to tell people exactly what I know and exactly what I don't know. And when I don't know, my job then comes down another decision tree, which is, let's wait, and you come back for this, or you go see this person to help us get the answer. And if we continue to all be responsible as patients and as clinicians and transparent about what we know and what we don't know, we will get so much more. If we can listen to someone reporting pain and we believe them, we will get so much farther. Problem is, determining credibility is an interesting complexity. So, you know, when you're not that worried and you come to see me for a well check with your child, my medical degree and my white coat and my stethoscope may be very meaningful. This is data from the National Immunization Conference of 2005. And what a clinicians looked at was how is it that parents are making decisions? What matters to them to make a good decision about vaccines? Well, when they're not that worried and you're just learning about what's coming up next, that white coat really matters. About 80% of the people said that was the most important thing for them but everything changes when we get really worried. It's really interesting, right, to think about what experts know when you're just learning about vitamin D on the news. But when you get really worried, everything changes. 
that really big piece of the blue pie, it completely shrinks. So when parents are worried about a vaccine problem, when they're worried about autism at an endpoint or neuro, neuro changes in their children, or they're worried about the fetal parts that are in vaccines, what really matters about my job is how I convey my honesty, how I listen, and how I express my empathy. That might be the most important thing, to have and help a family get to the good data. And this is how we can use technology. This is how we become more human. We live in this very rich time with incredible tools to demonstrate who we are as people and as partners in health. And this is how we will get there. I get to be caring and open, and I get to listen more online than I do in the exam space. This is um, from the um, Institute of Medicine, some infographics they've released recently. You know, we know that things aren't going that well. A third of adults say that the healthcare system is disorganized. Less than half of patients report that they feel they're satisfied with their level of decision making. You know this. We know this. We can't do it all in the exam space. So really what it is, what I was saying about 10 to 20 years from now, we've got these new responsibilities. I'm taking them now, and it can be ergonomically uncomfortable, it can hurt at times, but my new responsibilities as a physician is not just to do an exam when you're in your gown in the exam space, and it's not just to call you with the labs, it's to do a lot more. And if patient-centered care, if family-centered care with which I was reared at Seattle Children's Hospital is going to be, I'm gonna have to do something very different. You know, this is a pediatric study looking at by report and recall, where parents came out of, of well child checkups, and they said, how much time did you get with your doctor? So after the age of two, you get, a, you get one well child checkup a year. In Washington State, you get one every two years. So you're supposed to preserve your wellness and get the expertise from your doctor for 15 to 20 minutes, maybe, mm, maybe. About half had 11 to 20 minutes. And look at that third, had less than 10 minutes with a clinician. Doctors really do want to answer those non-billable questions. We really do want to answer those questions. But I am reported to finish what I'm doing in a certain amount of time, to document it in the EHR, to think about being on time so my patient satisfaction scores are there, to get through the agenda of things I feel like families need, and then to answer the list of questions that patients bring for me in the exam space. So I've got to do it outside. Great practice in the state of Pennsylvania, engaged. Every single clinician in the office is contributing to a Facebook page. The nurses answer questions in triage online. They share YouTube videos. They respond to new data. Incredible. This is happening in social tools right now. But really, these are the pro-social uses. This is not me just talking and saying and, and, and spokespersoning for someone else. This is really me learning insight. You know, Google and the search um, that was done by the Google Health team looking at suicide, I use this almost every week in my office. This is not hard. This is not advanced technology. Anyone with a computer can say to a teenager, you know, when you're feeling really crappy or when you know that your friend is feeling really crappy and you get scared and you don't have the crisis help number in your telephone, you know what you can do? You can go to Google, you can type in suicide, and the very first thing that will always come up is a phone number. It doesn't take that long. You know, I can go and learn more about what people are worried about the flu shot by just searching flu shot in Twitter. I can go when I do a live television interview about sudden infant death syndrome, where I talk about being in a crib on their back without anything fluffy, and the live image that they decide to put on is a baby with a pillow and a blanket propped up in a crib. And I can tell them, and I can rewrite it, and we can work and educate together. When the LA Times puts up something that's irresponsible in the photograph that doesn't go with the data, I can tell them and actually change things. This is our new responsibility. Not just data, but explanation of data. Pairing great information about your N of 1 with someone who can help explain that. Once we really move more towards ACOs, once we really understand and take the time to value communication, will move things. But I really think I'm still a little bit of an outlier. So I don't think I'm a, I'm a crazy. And when I'm in situations like this, I know you guys are believers. And I know that we're working together to solve these problems. But I recently spoke um, just about a month and a half ago at an ethics conference. And this is a dear friend of mine who reads my blog, is a young parent and vaccine researcher. And this is what he said. And I want you to listen specifically to how the audience reacts at an ethics conference, a national, international ethics conference. That historically. Getting personal is not something I'm accustomed to doing. I'm proof positive of this. I've yet to join Twitter or Facebook. In fact, 140 character updates on what I'm doing whenever I'm doing it sort of makes me want to vomit. <laughs> Dr. Swanson, I'm ashamed. <laughs> well, 
Well, I think what's really there is that it feels really comfortable here that we're going to use these tools. We're going to go together, and this is all going to happen. But the reality is we still have a really big needle to move. There was applause and laughter and a pause that he was, he was throwing me under the bus, even though he believes what I'm doing. Because we still believe that using these tools may be really about what we had for breakfast. And really, the other thing we have to think about is when we throw doctors out and we say, instead of just talking in the exam room, which is how you learn to communicate when you're in medical school, when we ask you to use an amplifier and we ask people to do this and go out publicly, we need to remember how difficult and how awful it can be. You can get exceedingly bullied. You can get death threats for just explaining what a policy statement is. So just this month, if you're interested, go and look at a blog post I wrote about circumcision. It's about a page back on my blog. And there's over almost 50 comments where I was um, compared to Sandusky three separate times, that I'm being compared to a pedophile because I'm trying to relate the science that led the Academy of Pediatrics to suggest that there might be medical benefit to circumcision. So what we really have to do is support, make good plans to teach each other how to respond in real time as our roles shift and as clinicians are out more in the public and more easily attacked. We really do have to think about how do we support each other and help each other understand. I'm going to move forward and make you want to vomit, but I have to make this point. I really believe that these social tools will improve our lives as clinicians. Doctors aren't really that happy all the time. And this is data out of the Archives of Internal Medicine this month, looking at burnout and percent of work satisfaction, people who feel that they have enough time in their clinical lives to enjoy them. We're really only at about 40%. 40% of specialists also, and generalists, really feel an overwhelming sense of burnout. And the reason is, there's something so magical about doing one thing at a time. So I'm not asking everyone to use Twitter while they're seeing patients, but I do want to remind you that we really love the internet. This is a graphic from BCG that looks at um, interview data that, what would you give up for the internet? Yeah, 84% of people would give up satellite nav. 69% would give up coffee. One in five of you would give up sex. <laughs> and 7% of people would rather give up showering than the internet. <laughs> This is the time when we start to communicate in different ways, when we value communication as much as we value technology, as Dr. Donald Berwick says. This is the beginning of something rich, emotive, and human. And technology, I believe, is just so easy to amplify that feeling. Thank you so much. Thank you.